the Atlas Leadership Series. It's a thought, uh, thought leadership series where we welcome experts, guests, uh, people with a lot of board governance experience to come share their point of view, uh, hopefully provide you with some new insights uh, to, to aid you or support you in your board governance work. Um, so we're very happy to have you and thank you for joining us this afternoon. About one more minute till show time, a little bit less, but um, if you signed up for this webinar, Mastering Best Board Best Practices, uh, Essential Skills for Effective Nonprofit Leadership, you are in the right place. Uh, we will get started here uh, right on time at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is about five seconds away. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, start with just a little light housekeeping. Uh, we do this at the top of every one of our webinars. This is a Zoom webinar platform, so all guests are muted by default. However, we do highly encourage you to participate uh, in form of questions, comments, feedback. Um, I will be uh, in the, the Q&A feature and the chat uh, thread as the webinar progresses as uh, Dr. Uh, Sokash is giving her presentation. Uh, so if you do have questions, uh, we'll be sure to, to help answer those. And then the Q&A part of the, the presentation is actually at the end of the webinar. Um, so I will collect your questions or answer them if, if, if I can, if they're uh, more technical related and then we'll serve them up at the end of the webinar. Um, through this presentation, there will be, uh, I think, four uh, interactive poll questions that are related to the presentation. If you could participate with that, it would be really great. We do love to engage with you, our audience. Uh, and just before the audience Q&A, we have a very, very, very quick audience uh, poll. It just helps us understand how we presented all the content, how we could do it better. Uh, just a very quick feedback poll. If you are unfamiliar with Onboard or haven't uh, visited our website or interacted with us, uh, we are primarily a, uh, we design digital experience that make board meetings more simple, uh, more secure and more effective. Um, and a little bit about us and who we serve. Uh, we currently have more than 6,000 board led organizations as our customer base, which we're very proud of and we're very proud to serve. That includes more than 100,000 users. Uh, we help host more than 60,000 board meetings and committee meetings each year, and we are present in 60 plus countries across the world, so uh, we're very kind of proud of those facts if you uh, aren't aware. Um, this is a, just an old kind of like mission vision uh, statement chestnut from our, our co-founder and CEO, Perun Shada, who continues to lead the organization today. Uh, there are three types of board meetings. There's the board meeting you prepared for, uh, there's the board meeting you actually had, and then there's the board meeting you wish you had. Uh, and it's our endeavor, obviously, our goal to, to provide our customers and our users with that third type of board meeting uh, when and if we can, um, which we hope is consistent. Uh, very, very excited to, to introduce you to today's speaker. Uh, I've had just a, a, a blast and, and a, a great joy getting to know uh, Dr. Emily Sokash over the last couple of weeks as we uh, prepare for this presentation. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of the Nonprofit Help Center. Uh, she's also an organizational leadership psychologist. So that's where the doctor comes from. Um, she's a very experienced NPO executive director, has served on a number of boards and board roles. Uh, and to, to my, <laughs> this is my part I put in there. Uh, she's also a Volkswagen bus and my favorite car of all time, Suzuki Samurai enthusiast, my first car. So we, uh, we've uh, bonded over our uh, classic car enthusiasm uh, <laughs> topics. You can find her at the nonprofithelpcenter.com. And uh, Emily, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Josh. And yes, that was definitely a bonding moment when we were talking <laughs> about uh, cars and uh, travel related to cars. And so, you know, I love that you put that in here because uh, like I'm a real person and every one of us on this call, we're real people, right? With with all of the different ways that we show up. And one of the ways I show up is with some kooky car fascination. So totally down with it, Josh. So as Josh said, we're going to have some poll questions. He's going to be manning the, the chat and the Q&A functions. So please feel free. Be active with your fingers right now. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover. This is actually one of my very favorite topics to cover. So let's uh, go ahead and we're going to switch over to my screen share. And everybody should now be seeing the uh, opening slide, Mastering Board Best Practices, Essential Skills for Effective Nonprofit Leadership. And Josh, I know that if there is any difficulty with the tech, you are going to give me a heads up. I'm just organizing where everybody is hanging out. Okay, so I am so tickled to be here. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics to speak on because as you saw, in my little mini bio that Josh presented, I am an organizational and leadership psychologist. So leadership topics 
are totally my jam. A little bit about the Nonprofit Help Center, just so you know who's on the other side of this call. Um, we're the folks who are training the people who power your mission. We are all about helping hundreds of nonprofit teams nationwide train, sustain, and retain their people board members and staff members through a unique suite of professional development and capacity building services. Josh shared with you my website. You can reach me at Emily at, and you can also check out our board training. Josh will speak to that a little bit later in our call. Now, during the course of our conversation today, I've divided our experience of looking at today's board leadership lens kind of in three different components. So first things first, we're going to set the table with understanding key leadership styles. We're then going to turn our attention to implementing board leadership assessments, particularly a self-assessment. And then finally, we're going to wrap that all together with a neat and tidy bow on how we can use key leadership styles and our understanding of self to foster collaboration and strengthen relationships within the board, between the board and the organization, and the organization out to the community. So the importance of board leadership. Now, Leadership at its core can be defined as influencing people to accomplish a common goal. So when we think about traditional leadership models, these focus on the leader's ability to inspire and motivate other people. And it kind of sets up this structure where we have a leader and then we have some number of followers. Now, these traditional leadership styles, and we're going to cover four of them, there are two types of actions that are related to leadership. One is directive. This is where I tell you what to do. And the other is participative, which is where we invite the input of others. Most of the leadership styles that we look to lean into within the nonprofit sector fall into that second action category, participative. And if we look at leadership under the microscope, there's actually three components to how the leadership experience works. There is the imprint, and don't worry, there will not be a test, but there's the imprint side of things. This is the way that you as a leader are experienced by others. There are the functions that you're doing. These are the practices that you employ to mobilize your fellow board members, your colleagues, to get things done. And then there's finally your motivations. These are the desires, the stimulus, the incentive that drives you to take a certain course of action. And a little bit later in our presentation, we're going to come back to those normal human motivations that drive all of us as leaders. A couple fun nonprofit facts that I think set a nice backdrop for understanding the board's leadership. So let's run through these and then we're going to make sense of them. So... These numbers show us that, let's start from the bottom left, one in three, 37% of nonprofits surveyed, this was at the end of 2023, they might be looking to their board to help them navigate and fill gaps related to staffing capacity. This is one of their top challenges reported on the people side of things. Also, 30%, also one in three, uh, their top challenge surrounding their people is recruitment and retention on both the staff and the board side. So nonprofit leadership in terms of the people side of things is incredibly important. Now, when we marry this up with some um, employment and some economic factors, we can see why it's important to a higher degree that we look at developing our board leadership. So nonprofits share of our total GDP across the United States, 6%, that's not nothing, and one in 10 Americans who are of working age are employed by a nonprofit. Now, when you think about this, our board members are leading a total of 1.5 million nonprofits in the United States alone. And these nonprofits represent $2.62 trillion in total revenue each year. To put it shortly, your leadership matters. So let's do a little bit of a refresh on when we talk about board leadership, what governance and management actually mean. It's important to differentiate where our leadership is applied. So board leadership is applied around matters of governance and professional staff leadership is applied around matters of management. Now, in making this distinction, I want to be super clear that leadership happens within all functions and at all levels of a nonprofit organization, whether that's within the board or within the staff. 
So quick review of the typical balance between board and staff functions of governance and management. So governance, this is the practice of the board of directors coming together to make decisions about the direction of the organization. These duties include things like oversight, strategic planning, decision making, financial oversight, all of that planning that we do that is future focused, that falls under governance, which is squarely within the board's duties. Some questions that can kind of help us determine if something is more of a governance versus a management issue. Things like, is it big? Is it about the future? Is it core to our mission? Is this a high level policy that needs to be thought about to resolve a situation? Is this a red flag flying? Is this a watchdog watching? Does the CEO want and need the board support? All of those questions, if affirmative, likely are going to put us onto the governance side of things. Now, on the other side of our slide here, we see management. Management supports and implements the board's defined goals and values. Our staff members make routine operational decisions. They handle all of the administrative work that makes our nonprofit tick. The administration is what is connecting and interconnecting every department of the operation with our strategic plan. Now, our professional staff uses leadership in order to help set direction alongside the board, but even more importantly, translating this direction, this North Star, into measurable goals, implement, implementation plans, and accountability structures. So first poll question, get ready to respond, get your clicker ready. Is your board balanced in its energies between governance and management. You've got four options here. Yes is yes, we are balanced. I think we're putting our energies in the right places. Or we might be too much governance focused, or we might be too much management focused. Or you can, of course, do the option of we are a mess. I can't even speak to this. So take a moment and we're going to give you maybe 15 more seconds. Think about it. There, there's no test and it is anonymous. I can hum the Jeopardy theme song if we want. Okay, so wrap up and let's see. Okay, cool. So we've got almost half of us are feeling like, yeah, we're pretty in balance between governance and management. Fantastic. A couple, we have 9% are looking at, um, we are too much governance focused. There was another chunk that was management focused and a couple of folks, I'm sorry to say you were a mess. So what do we do with this data? It's tempting to say that that 47% that said, yeah, we're pretty balanced to think we've got leadership uh, figured out. But in fact, I would argue that at every level of this, whether you're feeling balanced or you're feeling a little bit too much to one side or the other, we all have learning to do. And the reason for that is when we're balanced, we can learn about what is working and what do we want to continue to replicate well, when we look at we might be to one side or the other, we might look to find where our leadership gaps are. So now let's look to, we're going to use this to springboard into an understanding of four key leadership styles. Now, a little bit of a preface. There are more leadership styles than the four that we're looking at today. None of them are right. None of them are wrong. It's all about who is doing them, what the situation uh, needs, and really what the nonprofit needs. So... In each of these activities, um, both on the governance and the management side, we have the opportunity to demonstrate leadership. So when we see balance, we usually see that our leadership skills are being appropriately deployed across all of those functions that we talked about, and we're going to bring them back in a moment. Now, I want you to put your thinking caps on because in a moment, I'm going to ask you where you think you resonate as a leader. So let's run through these. Democratic leadership is, as you might guess, a very equity-oriented uh, approach. This is where um, we use this in instances where your nonprofit would benefit from lots of discussion and brainstorming and kind of group decision-making. Uh, a leader is still present. That leader is guiding the process. The democratic leadership style is largely used to surface the voice of the people. When we look at strategic leadership, this is defined as the process of setting direction and then aligning and mobilizing our people and our resources to move in that direction. Strategic leadership is particularly motivational to those individuals who are drawn toward order, control, and planning. And I think that 
You know who you are if you're on this call. Now, coach style leadership, this is a style that actually can be tremendously useful in your board service. How so? Well, coach style leaders focus on developing and inspiring others to realize that other person's own goals. And that goal can include the nonprofit's mission. So this style is all about encouragement. It's about drawing out the strengths of others and engaging in leadership that explores the other person's growth. So this is very other focused. And then finally, transformational leadership, another style really useful for board members. This type of leadership focuses on creating a strong, clear, compelling vision that you end up sharing with others. This in turn often makes others eager to get on board with whatever you're endeavoring to, uh, to accomplish. So this compelling vision might be as broad as the organization's mission statement, or it could be as narrow as getting a project done within a committee that you're involved with. This type of leadership is all about letting the vision lead the action. And each of these styles of leadership is great when they're done in the right settings and in the right hands. So now let's take a look at each of these with the pros and cons, a little bit of a deeper dive. So democratic leadership. This can motivate through all the ways in that it engages all voices. So when everyone's involved, everyone has a chance to channel their energies around a common goal. And when board members show democratic leadership, they ensure that they're giving and expecting the same level of attention and involvement across all members of the board and the professional leadership. If anybody is left out or excluded, uh, it can be difficult to re-engage those team members unless you really re-commit to democratic leadership. So if you are someone who promotes creativity, who has a drive towards being inclusive, is naturally pretty collaborative and you like to build trust, then you might resonate as a democratic leader. On the pro side, democratic leadership is super empowering because everybody has a seat at the table, everybody has a voice. It can really increase the team satisfaction on both the um, board side as well as the professional side because everyone is feeling heard, understood, and they have a personal stake in the outcome that is that you're moving toward. Now on the cons, every leadership style has a con to it. In this case, democratic leadership is slow for decision-making. It, um, it can require you to build a coalition. It can require you to convince others. It can require a lot of repeated conversations. It can also cause some communication failures because it does require so much intense labor but it is worth it in certain scenarios. Scenarios like encouraging creativity, working with younger team members who want to feel heard, and then also engaging with experts who also want to feel heard. So you might see yourself in democratic leadership. Now, conversely, strategic leadership takes a little bit of a different take. This is great when we're facing challenges, um, unexpected situations, setbacks, crises, um, even a disruption in staffing. These all benefit from the structured nature of strategic leadership. Strategic leadership is particularly motivational because it ties deliberately and specifically to your overall vision and strategy. But it can be demotivational when it's applied to situations that require all those things that we just talked about with democratic leadership, creativity, brainstorming, shared leadership. So if you are someone who finds yourself to be an effective communicator, a structured finisher, and you, you know who you are, if you like really have a drive to complete things, um, if you like focusing on the details of the future, and if you like to challenge the status quo, strategic leadership might be your jam. Now on the pro side of things, strategic leadership relies a lot on objectivity, objective data, community-based evidence. Um, it also, works really well to build commitment and clarity around the tasks at hand. Now on the cons side of things, the future focus of strategic leadership can be distracting from what needs to happen in the here and now. It can be inflexible uh, because it is so highly structured and it can be expensive if not done well. And when I say expensive, I mean, it can require a lot of time, 
a lot of resources related to um, strategic planning process and trying things that may ultimately cost money and not work out how you expected. However, strategic leadership really is great for evaluating new initiatives, developing and monitoring plans you have in place, and then also when matters are particularly timely, like those crises that I mentioned. Coach style leadership. Now, I know we're not supposed to play favorites, but I will say that this is my favorite leadership style to see when I am working with a board or when I am showing up on one of the boards that I serve on. Um, by the way, I'm on the executive committee of a local social service organization that has a very sizable budget. And this organization uses a lot of coach style leadership across board members to really get our mission moving forward. So coach style leadership is particularly appropriate for those who have been on the board for a few years because it gives you the opportunity to mentor new board members or offer guidance and support to those who are struggling, um, often on the board side, but that can also be on the staff side as well. Coach, le coach style leadership has the ability to energize and empower individuals in the organization because of its highly individualized nat nature. And it also is very motivating because of that one-on-one -on -one attention and reconnection potential to the mission and to direct leaders. So what does coach style leadership look like? It's less about giving orders or blowing your whistle from the sidelines, and it's more about nurturing the development of those around you. So you can see why it's a good fit for those who have been on the board for a little while. In this leadership, style. We set a tone of encouragement. We allow others to take ownership of decisions and to be creative in a way that, that brings them joy. And there's a lot of time spent in guiding conversation rather than directing outcomes. So if you are somebody who is collaborative, if you're really interested in others' progress or others' experience, if you're comfortable with feedback, both giving and receiving, and if you have kind of a natural focus on empathy between people and building trust, then coach style leadership might be your style. On the pro side of things, the benefits of coach style leadership are that the expectations at the individual level are very clear and it transforms deficits into strength. But on the flip side, coach style leadership, as you can imagine, is really time intensive. When we're working with bringing out the best in people, that takes time. It's also hard to do well. Uh, often we see board members who say, I would love to coach board member Josh on improving the way that he shows up as a leader. Often if somebody self-identifies that they want to do coaching, they still need to do some work themselves. And putting it frankly, they may not be suited to be a coach. And that unfortunately can lead to impacting progress if it's done poorly. Not everybody is, is cut out to be a coach, but it is great for subsets of teams or committees because we're dealing with that smaller one-on-one -on -one or one-to-a-couple relationship. Um, it's great for when decisions are not pressing, and it's great with long-term relationships with the board. Somebody who you see as having that potential to be um, a committee chair, executive committee, and maybe even a future board chair. Finally, transformational leadership. So in practice, transformational leaders do three things consistently. First, they articulate positively about the vision. Second, they communicate in a fashion that details what success really looks like. And then third, they actively encourage input and dialogue from the entire team. Sometimes this, this style of leadership can feel a little bit more democratic because it encourages ideas and it fosters collaboration. And that's fine if there's nothing dire that needs immediate attention. But the difference here is that a transformational leader or transformational leadership approaches, they let the vision drive the action. It's not without its pitfalls. Um, it can be difficult to kind of generate a sense of motivation uh, motivation and collaboration when we have high standards, the vision is out there and we might have moments where we fall behind or we're a little bit disappointed. There are high expectations for success, which means we can also open up for burnout. So if you are someone who is really focused on aligning 
between, it could be between our um, strategic planning process and our staff. It could be across staff members. It could be between board buddies and staff. If there's a pull towards accountability that you have in your heart, if you are somebody who has an emphasis on individual control of your work approach, or if you have a growth orientation and you really connect with the vision of your organization, transformational leadership practices might be your thing. Now on the plus side, transformational leadership promotes motivation because we're moving towards this North Star, this, this um, vision for the organization, and it really encourages personal development. But on the con side, it can prioritize the long-term over the short-term, which can open up the potential for burnout. So this style is great for big picture initiatives where the vision can be rallied as well as clearly connecting the organization's goals with individual roles. So I ask you to put your thinking cap on. And so now is your time to shine. I am curious for this question, what is your personal leadership style of those four? Do you see yourself more democratic, strategic, coach style, or transformational? So take a few seconds to go ahead and respond to that. We'll give you maybe just five or 10 more seconds. Okay, ooh, we have kind of a nice split. A lot towards coach style, 44%, with some pretty even distribution between strategic and transformational, and about 27% at democratic. Awesome, thank you. So now I'm gonna go to a second question, kind of a follow-on. When you think about your board's leadership style on the whole, where do you think that your fellow board members generally fall? And I know it's difficult to put everybody in one bucket, but just think, when your board is considering matters, where does the leadership style tend to gravitate? Again, same four options. Okay, let's see those results. Okay, interesting. 44% democratic, 44% strategic with just a pinch coach and a pinch transformational. It's very interesting. It's interesting to me to see this division because we as individuals show up in one way, other people show up in their own leadership style, and then the organization needs us to show up in potentially an entirely different uh, way of leading. Now, Let's go back to this governance versus management chart. And I took the liberty here of, of kind of slicing up what types of leadership styles are often um, in good alignment with these particular roles. So if you considered yourself, let's say, a democratic leader, you probably would do a fantastic job participating actively in things like being future focused or decision making you might find that you want to develop a little bit more of your strategic leadership or your transformational leadership so you can really tap into setting the course through our goals, visions, and values or strategic planning. Each of these aspects, regardless of this being kind of more goal or more um, board roles or more um, staff roles, each of our functions requires kind of a different way to show up as leaders. And so to that end, we're going to turn to our second section of our time together today here, implementing board leadership assessments. So in this time, we're now going to take a look at how to best understand yourself as a leader, how you show up, and how you want to grow as a leader. So doing any sort of a self-assessment, whether it's about your leadership, whether it's about your healthy behaviors, whether it's about how you are as a community member, it requires us to turn the mirror on ourselves and to do some sort of look inside. Now, I think that there are four ways to get this done. I think that they all work well together. Um, from, from a psychological perspective, I think that there's one that stands head and shoulders above the rest. So first, we can do some sort of a formal assessment. So this is the type of assessment that you do with an executive coach or you do a free one online. I think that they all have merit and they all have benefit depending on how you want to use it. 
So when we do this assessment, any sort of a, what type of leader am I? The biggest benefit is that it gets the ball rolling internally for our, for us to be thinking about, is this true? Why does, why, why do my results show up this way? You have to remember that anytime you do a formal assessment, you are really gauging a point in time measure of how you reacted to that particular instrument at that given time. So it can be affected by if you're hungry, it can be affected by if you're stressed, it can be affected by how confident you feel. So just keep in mind, anytime you do um, any of the uh, popular assessments or any of the online free assessments, it's just a point in time measure. And it's a good means of getting your thinking started. Now, self-observation can be a very effective way to also understand yourself as a leader. So you can take a look at this deck again after our call and say, hey, you know what? I think that I have the attributes of a strategic leader and this is how I activate around this. That self-observation can be just as effective as doing an assessment. Another way going outside of your own mind, asking for reflections from others on what they see in you as a leader can also be helpful. Um, when you ask for that feedback, notice that I said here, you're asking for reflections. You're not necessarily asking for suggestions uh, that comes later in our process. And the final way, and this I think is the most telling way to understand, understand yourself as a leader is to do some sandboxing. And this is where we experiment with different leadership styles. So one meeting you might try, you know, I just really want to be strategic at this meeting, even though I know that I gravitate towards being transformational or coach style. Um, that sandboxing helps us iterate on our own behaviors. We try them on and we see how they fit and we see how effective we are. Now I'm going to get into a little bit of the psychological underpinnings on why we want to and the benefit of understanding ourselves as leaders. So stick with me. We're going to talk about our style and use and our spouse style. And these are the two things that we really want to discover about ourselves when we turn the mirror on ourselves. Now, I'm going to give you a really hopefully relatable way of thinking about these two concepts. So if you have a streaming video service that you subscribe to, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, each of them has something called your watch list or your saved list or to watch later, whatever that um, saved videos list might be called. Now, when I look at mine, I look at my saved watch list, I see things like documentaries. I see classic films, some travel, um, travel shows. Cause I love to travel. Um, I see some vintage car stuff. As Josh said, I like kooky cars. And then when I compare my saved watch list to my actual watch list, it's different. Where is it different? Well, it's full of Survivor season 45. It's full of true crime dramas. It's full of kind of candy sort of watching. And why is that? Well, when I'm thinking about what I want to watch in the future or who I think I am in the future, I'm the type of person that watches documentaries. But in the moment, my behaviors are actually, I'm somebody who watches the Survivor show. And I use that as an example to share that it is hard to honestly evaluate what our leadership style in use is. While it's typically pretty easy to articulate what we espouse or what we hope to be as leaders, but when we discover our leadership style accurately, it's an amazing way to really evaluate our leadership. So let's talk about both of these. So one, our style in use. This is a means of getting what we want through our leadership. So our leadership style, whether we know it or not, typically also serves to meet our basic human needs around respect, belonging, self-esteem, confidence, personal growth, and actualization. Yes, you came to this board in order to feed hungry families, to help seniors stay in their homes and live independently, 
to cure um, all sorts of medical challenges or to make our world a more peaceful place. But as you show up at a board meeting, the way you show up as a leader also serves to support some of your basic core needs. That's part of the human experience. But it's rare that you would come into a board meeting and say, hey, I'm gonna show up as a leader that's really asking for your respect. Rather, you would say your espoused style. This is how we think or say that we show up in our leadership roles. This is the leadership style that we think we show up as even if our behavior doesn't follow. Fun fact, often when we're put into leadership positions or high conflict or um, high stakes situations, we often revert to mannerisms that worked for us as adolescents. And sometimes that can be enlightening when we see that another board member is behaving in a way that we didn't expect of them in their leadership. They might just be calling back to a time when they were younger. So when we have a sense of our actual leadership style in use, this is where we start to get a lot of traction. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, because we're able to identify our personal leadership gaps. So at the organizational level, at the board level, some common results of leadership gaps include a lack of accountability. There's no leadership bench. There's repetitive communications, like revisiting an issue over and over again, month after month. And there's also silos around activity or information. And each of those results comes from a leadership gap at the individual or the group level that hasn't been addressed. So when you are understanding your own leadership style, you can think about where does your natural style align with what the organization needs? And where can you perhaps adapt and flex? Now, if you are thinking, I want to really adapt and grow as a leader, you can then use your self-reflection to develop an improvement plan. Now, this is where you can look to develop one or two leadership attributes. Don't go crazy. Just try one or two things at a time and focus that around your keyboard responsibility or your area of focus. So from, I'll give you a personal reflection. So I've been on this, the one board that I mentioned for four years now. And just this year, I am taking on the role of secretary with the executive committee. My natural leadership style is verging on coach style. I really like working one-on-one -on -one with others, maybe a little bit of democratic. But my role now as secretary on the executive committee is going to scratch at some strategic leadership attributes that don't come naturally to me. And so I, in the coming year with this board, I'm focusing a little bit more on my structured work with the board and showing up with a little bit more objectivity in my role as a board member. And now, we also want, anytime we're doing that sort of improvement, to structure how to determine if you're improving towards what you want to be improving. And probably the best outcome of doing a self-evaluation is really getting a better sense of self. This is where you're identifying and leaning into your secret sauce. And you can develop parameters around where you want to take your leadership and where you don't. That brings us to our third section, fostering collaboration and strengthening relationships. And at this point in the conversation, um, I would encourage you to be thinking about some questions and answers that we can use to foster conversation for the last chunk of our time together today. So start putting those thinking caps on as we're talking through this last section. So how can we know whether to use or lean into or develop the coach style, the transformational, the democratic, the strategic leadership approaches. So many times we are called upon to adapt our leadership in the moment to the situation at hand. And to do so, we use an adaptive approach. Adaptive approaches to our leadership are at the heart of using leadership to collaborate. Uh, we need to be present enough to know this is my typical leadership style. I think this aspect or this particular topic needs me to show up in a different way. And to do so, we can take four actions, anticipation, articulation, adaptation, and accountability. So let's take a look at how each of these works. So when we think about our leadership, 
and how we want to deploy it. Anticipation is the process of trying to make sense and to make meaning of an ambiguous and rapidly changing reality. In your board service, this means doing some amount of prediction of what might be a difficult topic or a challenging situation on the next agenda, um, thinking ahead to how our other board members' reactions might affect the discussion surrounding a topic. Anticipation is all about expecting the unexpected. Then we get to articulation. This is the way that we communicate about our anticipated um, aspects of the conversation. Articulation helps us build collective understanding and a support for whatever action we feel we need to take. Now within the board's work, the professional staff and board members can work towards articulating the nonprofit's needs in a way that resonates with others. So this could be impact stories, it could be testimonials, anecdotes, a review of formal goals, sharing something that matters to you personally, looking at community-based evidence, reviewing data, any number of ways that you can articulate around a particular topic. And articulation directly supports your board service and the goals on how you shape how you want to improve your communication. Then we look at adaptation. This is where we take our leadership and we say, okay, we've gathered feedback, we have normalized our continuous learning, we really want to adapt how we show up as leaders as a group and as individuals. So when it comes to board service, this really just means being open to doing things in a new way. We know that the nonprofit landscape is constantly changing. So our leadership also needs to keep pace and change with evolving situations. So with adaptation, this might mean that we're gonna look to build certain capacities in our nonprofit. It might be that we take a new approach to how we spend time in our board meetings. Regardless of the change that needs to happen, adaptation should happen based on data and feedback so that that continuous improvement really is pursuing that North Star vision that you have. Now, finally, accountability. This is, it's not a dirty word, it's not to be feared, it's really the aspect of our adaptive leadership um, actions that can maximize our transparency. It can keep everyone focused on who will do what by when. It's my favorite. It's my favorite closing board phrase. Who will do what by when? And in terms of board service, accountability directly ties into our formal and our informal goals. So formal goals are those that are usually followed by plan, like strategic plan, annual plan, fundraising plan, capital campaign plan. Uh, The informal goals, though, could be from our board self-assessment on what we agreed that we wanted to do better. And so when we are adaptive and we hold ourselves to accountability mechanisms, this is where we can really apply some of that leadership. So let's put our thinking caps on. I have my final, my final poll question for you today. Which of these do you think is strongest among your board members? So as a group, are you best at anticipation? Are you best at articulation? Are you best at adaptation or best at accountability? Take a moment, think on this. And again, it's all uh, anonymous. Oh my goodness, quite the even spread. So adaptation ranked highest at 37%, followed by articulation and accountability. And then anticipation was the the lagger of the group at 17%. I love seeing that adaptation among this group is really the highest that you feel where your board has some good energy, some, um, some focus. Often with groups like this, I see that anticipation is one of those um, strengths of the board. And unfortunately, anticipation, as you just saw, is very early in the process of really applying our leadership in an adaptive way. And so I love seeing that adaptation is um, a shared strength among those who are on this call today. So speaking of strength and strengthening, when we have leadership awareness in ourselves and in others, we're really taking that collaboration 
to a point of strengthening our relationships. And this is really kind of the, the cherry on top. So relational awareness, trust in others, and leading ourselves are the three outcomes that happen when we understand our own leadership, we understand how to apply our leadership in a collaborative way, and we really try and show up for our organization. Relational awareness, this is something that compares or considers really how we think, feel, and act against what is going on within us, between us, and around us. And for those that are interested, I have this amazing graphic that I could do a whole webinar on at some future date. But really, relational awareness is where we're really looking at how do we all fit together the puzzle pieces of leadership within our organization and beyond our four walls. Trust in others, this is an outcome that happens when we understand how we show up as leaders, when we understand that there are a variety of leadership styles and different means of applying them. Uh, this trust helps us to honor the diversity of talent that's around our board table, basically understanding that our way is not the only way. And then finally, leading yourself is an outcome of self-awareness and leadership awareness. And it's also this antidote to leadership struggles where you might struggle with imposter syndrome or feelings of self-doubt or that you know you might not belong on the board because everyone is more connected or um, they have a longer service record or whatever your particular um, Achilles heel might be. But understanding your leadership secret sauce helps you lead yourself to become the best leader you can be, not in comparison to others. So top tips to close out. I have two top tips for you and some ideas on how to do them. So number one, Try one new thing, just one. You don't have to, um, as, as the old Jewish proverb goes, you don't have to fill the ocean with a spoon or empty the ocean with a spoon. Uh, rather, just try one thing to see what unsticks for you. So this might look like creating a leadership scorecard for your use in a meeting. And in this way, you would track your leadership moments. You can keep it private to yourself, it's okay. Uh, you also might recognize your intuition and see where it wants to take you and where you might think, oh, maybe I should go somewhere else that my intuition is not guiding me. Your intuition is typically your inner leader speaking. You could review the agenda items in advance and categorize each according to what is the most suitable leadership style and identify if you have that style, if you approach things in that style. That could be a great way to prepare mentally for any upcoming board meeting. And then my second tip for you, share with a trusted peer that you are working on developing your leadership. You can connect with another board member to share feedback. Now, typically I say, I, I strongly suggest that you wanna typically avoid open-ended questions like, hey, Josh, how do you think I'm doing as a leader? Uh, the responses that you get will not be helpful, they'll be very broad, and um, they may or may not help your relationship. But rather you could say, you know, hey, Madeline, I am looking to develop my ability to be more concise in my remarks at board meetings. As a leader, how do you think I'm showing up? And you'll get feedback that you find useful. You can also ask your executive director, your board chair, where they see there are leadership gaps in the board as a whole. And then you also could perform a postmortem, just basically an after action review on a recent issue that you were involved with. Think about how did you show up as a leader? How did others show up? How did you want to show up looking in the rear view? So now those are my top tips. I wanna thank everybody for being with us today. I'm going to stop my share and I would welcome your questions, curiosities, comments. Uh, let's, let's keep the dialogue going. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> thank you so much for that. Uh, I love it. And yeah, we have a, a couple of questions. Uh, I have a couple of questions myself, actually. <laughs> I'll, okay, I'll take let's the do opportunity. It. Let's kick uh, it up. But before we get into that, I want to uh, just I'll share, reshare my screen. Um, first, I want to do. Um, we've already done this. Uh, in the audience, um, we have another great speaker lined up for August. Uh, he's joined us before, Eric Hamburg. Uh, he's the author of the Little Book of Boards. I highly recommend the title. Uh, you can read it in the afternoon and it gives you such a great perspective on, on joining a board or what the board's uh, duties and commitments are and how to actually practically enable that. Um, so I'll join, I'll, we'll send a, a link to the, um, the email address you used to register with. Um, and then we're gonna run our quick 15 second feedback poll. 
thank you, Madeline. Uh, and one of the questions on there I, we're really interested in, uh, uh, as you can tell, we have a great affinity with with Emily. Uh, we have very aligned priorities and goals, I think, as organizations. Uh, we are considering uh, offering a, a, a nonprofit governance certification course through the onboard um, platform or to facilitate in some way. So that's one of the questions on there. If you're interested in that, we'd be happy to, to gauge your interest. Uh, all right. With that closed... I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll go to the audience Q and A. Um, got some great got some great uh, thank yous and and comments, positive comments. Um, uh, my internet actually dropped off for a little bit in in the middle of the session, so I don't have questions about the middle of the session. But um, okay. when you're talking about the the leadership style, and I, I like that you didn't say this is an appropriate leadership style for this size board or this type of mission. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that the, the, the board size, the number of seats on the board impacts that leadership style? Like you mentioned, coaching can be a little bit slower because it's kind of a more democratic and feedback moment in the process. You know, I think that is an excellent question. And the first place that my mind goes to, Josh, is that it's not so much about the size of the board, but perhaps the savvy of the board. So when we have a board, let's say that there are you know, seven board members. That is not a large board. I would love to see that that board be savvy enough to recognize that we want to generate a variety of leadership styles across us. And it would be difficult, I think, to um, really invest the time in some both democratic and coach style leadership because that board is going to be tasked with also moving things forward at a at a, a relatively quick cadence right when we have fewer board members is typically we have a working board um, so I think though that when we have a savvy board uh, coach style can have its role, but a larger board does lend itself a little bit better to having a coach style leadership present within the group. That's great. And then you you kind of actually touched on one of my other questions was uh, if you're if you're happen to be working on a on a fundraising board where the the, the donors or some of the directors or a, a big portion of the directors, how do you handle that that leadership feedback if it's somebody who's literally essential to the organization's funding? Obviously, probably pretty tactful, I would, I would imagine. Very tactfully, <laughs> yes, very delicately. So there's a book, and I'm it, the, the title of it is escaping me, but it's something like, I think it's Thanks for the Feedback. Uh, and this is, and our conversation today is about leadership. It's not about giving and receiving feedback effectively. But I do recommend uh, the Thanks for the Feedback book. Um, and I see Josh is looking I'm up. I'm standing my book my bookshelf right now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great book because it's a little bit tongue in cheek and a little bit snarky. It speaks to the a scenario like you have presented here, Josh, where you know we might have uh, someone who offers feedback. Uh, on developing as a leader. Um, I'm going to guess that a lot of the nonprofit professionals on this call today have probably received this feedback unsolicited and perhaps well-intentioned, but not particularly useful. So we handle these things with tact. And we also look at my recommendation on all of with my coachees is we look to the opportunity to align our mutual interest in moving the organization's mission forward. And so, you know, sharing that we both have a commitment to developing leaders at all levels, that thank you so much for, you know, having that transparency and authenticity to bring an issue to me or to make suggestions about my performance. I'm always open to hearing how I am received by others. And then we take it back to that self-reflective space of, is this something that I want to be mindful of? Is this something I want to take action on? And it doesn't have to be either of those things yeah and that I, could be I, and that could be a leadership action in and of itself yeah and I, I love that you 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 mentioned that um the uh, the reflection of of how my voice is received I, I I just learned this very recently that you know the it is up for the listener to uh determine how they receive the message not necessarily the speaker and I think that's so important especially in board leadership right. roles and especially with those who may be interacting with staff or management uh, on the operational level that they have, you know, I don't know what the the, the multiplier is, that, they, that their voice is louder or more impactful um, 
than others. And so th there may be more sensitivity uh, to the things that are said. So there should be more sensitivity around how, how it's said and how it's received. I love that. Yeah. Um, we don't have that. We don't get a lot of uh, audience questions so far. Uh, one other kind of question I had was so much of board effectiveness uh, as boards write themselves. We, we do the uh, study or a survey once a year about board effectiveness. And one of the really consistent features within that board effectiveness profile is to say, what are you really good at as a board? And the number one answer almost year over year uh, of the last three or four years running that we've had the survey is that we're really good at continuity. Um, and I think when I think about leadership styles, and obviously that's the purpose of the board is to continue the mission, continue the organization's um, um, contributions to the community or whatever mission they have. But then it makes it very difficult. You'd mentioned the, oh, I'm, I'm on a board with, you know, I'm on my fourth year of the board. Uh, I'm very comfortable with those folks. But how do you, um, and this is probably under strategic or transform, transformative leadership style, how do you introduce change management when something does need to break or something needs to go away or something needs yeah. to be um, kind of uh, evolved, I guess you would say. Yeah. Evolved. That's a, that's a lovely phrase, evolved. When we need to evolve and we need to elevate something, it really does come into that adaptive space where we need to be taking in the data whether it's community-based evidence, whether it's internal data, and looking at, okay, what do we sense is broken or needing improvement? And what does that improvement look like? What is the ultimate result that we want to get to? And when we actually go into a, in this instance, a strategic leadership mindset, and we're kind of sussing out and untangling all of the, the people side of things, we're sussing out Remember, strategic leadership is all about questioning the status quo where we're comfortable saying, okay, what we've done got us here. It won't get us there. When we're comfortable with that, then we can start to really embrace change management. But part of, part of that journey is recognizing that there are different leadership styles in the room and some will not have the same degree of comfort with keeping an arm's reach at letting go of things that you know, perhaps have been done the same way for a long time. Now, I'm very lucky because the organization that I'm with, it's a very evolved, very, um, very mature organization that embraces that change in a number of ways. But I recognize that is not the case in a lot of organizations. And now, Josh, I do want to transition over. I see Chandra had raised yep. a question about how do you feel about adding these kinds of questions and assessments when recruiting new board members? So I will tell you my favorite assessment that can be done at the group level, and it's oddly enough, highly robust and low cost. It is the Clifton Strengths Finder. The Strengths Finder, it's a popular tool. And <laughs> yeah, I, it's hard to hate, right? It's digestible, accessible, and it can be analyzed um, on the group level to identify where you have gaps. If you do a Google search for, um, I think it's like the Clifton Strengths matrix or the spreadsheet, you can see who falls into which um, particular groupings. And Chandra, I highly recommend that type of an assessment um, that can be done in the aggregate and that can be um, really uh, well understood and engaged with at the individual level. It's that that assessment is a pleasure to complete. It really is. Yeah, I I I, always, I, I joke about this. It's, I, I take it seriously because I did have the benefit of, of Clifton Strengths Finders in the last twelve months. Um, I I call it a professional horoscope sometimes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll go with that. Yeah. yeah. But to to your your point, the the Clifton Strengths Finder, the thing that I found that was the most um, beneficial. You need a lot of different types of players, a lot of different skills. Obviously, you know if you're a more uh, uh, governance mature board, you, you might have a skills matrix to help fill that out. Uh, but the most amazing thing about the Clifton Strengths Finder is that it says, here are your four strengths, mm -hmm. and here's how you can uh, adapt and, and collaborate with somebody who has these other four strengths. Exactly. Uh, so it, it bridges the gap if you have uh, kind of disparate yin and yang people in your organization. So I, I highly recommend that as well. I, I have it literally on my bookshelf. I have no affiliation with them other than being a longtime lover of their product. I think that it's a solid piece and it works really, really great. Chandra's already on it. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Predictive <laughs> index is another one that's similar to that. I, I, I found much more value in the, in the Clifton Strengths Finder. So that's yep. great. Yep. Um, 
Well, with that, uh, I, I don't have any more questions. Emily, thank you so much for joining. I, I love the presentation. I, I love your presence Happy. as always. Um, you're just such a, a warm and friendly person. I, I would love to have you back on for that uh, that chart or that graphic. You said you could do a whole presentation for. Um, but I think our audience members would agree this is a really great presentation, very engaging and, and lots of good information. Oh, we have one last question before we end. Uh, okay. from George. Um, Committees and oh yeah, multiple different boards. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, obviously, in a in a university or higher education structure, you have different boards with different goals. Your your board of alumni, your board of trustees, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how do you how do you mash those together? Okay, so George, here's my my sixty second assessment. Uh, probably a future presentation. You just <laughs> took the words out of my mouth, but I will say that those types of leadership styles that I covered, uh, particularly Democratic and Coach, that I said were kind of labor intensive, those are great for our advisory committees, our um, task forces, our ad hoc committees that kind of exist as needed. And then as you go up that funnel to the pinnacle of, you know, your oversight board, your, your big mothership boards, that's where we start to get far more strategic and really, there's kind of a laser focused version of transformational leadership that's really appropriate at that level. There can be a nice hybrid there. But yeah, they draw up kind of through a pyramid of like engaging versus strategic. And that's definitely my experience where you see much more, as George mentions, it gets more formalized as you go up that that pyramid as you met, as you mentioned. Exactly. Great. We're at the we're at the hour. I like to start on time and end on time. Uh, so Emily, thank you again for a great presentation. Uh, thank you, audience members, for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, we will send uh, both the, the presentation slide deck and a recording of this webinar to you via email, um, likely in the next 24 hours. Uh, but thank you so much and have a great afternoon or morning or evening, uh, wherever you are. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Josh.